so pleased to have back with us Bob Carnegie, who is the U.S. Army veteran and DAV, that's Disabled American Veterans, first junior vice command the Department of Indiana. And we're going to be talking exactly about uh, Chapter 17, Indiana DAV Chapter 17. So good to see you back. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. You're great. Well, <laughs> all the things you've been doing. I, I, I do a lot of stuff, Cliff. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> but it's all good. It, it is yeah, very good, it and, is I, good. and I enjoy doing it. It's good. I know, and that makes it, as we say, more better. Yes, right. Yeah, that <laughs> that more better, That right. makes it more That's better. That's right. Catch yourself for those who may not know, Bob, about the organization and what you do. Sure. For, first, I want to just mention, of course, got to do that. You're, you're a U.S. Army veteran. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. What unit were you? I was in a group called the uh, uh, Signal uh, First, for the Regional Communications Group in Vietnam, and we had five yeah. Yeah. location, f- four locations where we had telephone switches on the ground in battalion locations, and that setup was then tied together and carried long lines communications to the United States for all of Southeast Asia. Oh, that's a that's a hell of a job. And uh, you know. The VC could take Plantation yeah. Road right in town, and mm-hmm. our switch was 100 feet inside the gate, and they'd walk by every day and not know what we had. Isn't that so? It's amazing. Yeah, the more you think of that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's they'd, right. They had wrecked havoc with communications no, for course, the United yeah. States, mm-hmm. and it was, they were 100 feet from it every time they walked past us. <laughs> that, you know, I know that story, and that's why I wanted you to say it again because it's 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 really something that uh, something like that would happen. Uh, that it worked. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it worked. Uh, you've got all kind of things going, uh, Bob. What else do we need to know? Well, I think probably uh, first off, I've been very fortunate to get involved with um, w- with the DAV, and because of uh, being involved with the DAV, I've had the opportunity to get involved with the state DAV. And last week I was asked to go to Washington, D.C. with about seven or eight of us from Indiana. And the reason for that, we joined the, all the DAV from across the United States. A, a select few get invited to attend a, a conference, which is called the Midwinter Conference. And there's probably about uh, three or four hundred people that are part of this. There's a million three DA, uh, DAV members across the United States. Million but, three. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, this is the, the, the leadership group. And the reason we meet in Washington, D.C. is uh, then we, that gives us access to our senators and representatives mm-hmm. at a national level. And so we put together an agenda every year that we think is important for veterans from the perspective of the DAV. And then we go to the Hill and by state meet our uh, representatives and our senators and we share that perspective. And then we're asked to attend a combined meeting of the House and Senate. And it's a meeting of the uh, Veterans Administration Committee for the federal government. And so I was able to sit and listen to that where our national commander presented uh, to Congress officially this plan that I'm going to share a few things with you. Mm -hmm. And then Congress has the opportunity to ask questions of him, and he brings his staff members to that to help him. And, of course, some of the issues he may know right off the top of his head, but some of them they might get a little bit more detail, and he's got these staff members there to help him answer the questions. That sounds great. And the the thing that I think uh, impressed me in sitting in this big room and listening to this was the fact that those senators and representatives were really playing, paying close attention. And That's great. Yes, yeah. it is, because, you know, yeah. sometimes we think they're playing video games yes. on their computers exactly. and, and exactly. got the chair reclined back, and uh, there mm-hmm. should be a pillow behind their head. Mm-hmm. But um, in this whole session was probably about an hour and a half to two-hour session. They were not. And so that warmed my heart to see that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is they think um, a lot about the Veterans Administration and how it is working and how the veterans are being serviced. And because they hear one, it falls off the rails. Mm -hmm. Loud and clear because people make a lot of noise when it falls off the rails. And I can tell you, Cliff, that some of that is is legitimate and they should get 
a little straightened out by the veterans. But I can my own personal experience over the last eight years, it's been nothing but wonderful. I, I mean, I have not had a glitch. And I've had some issues and things that yeah. had to get taken care of. And I had one issue that was really kind of pop up all of a sudden. And I made one phone call. They got a hold of my general practice doctor at the VA. That person saw me. I think I called about 9 o'clock. I had an appointment by 2. I had a blood test before I saw that person. That person analyzed me. Uh, That doctor analyzed me and said, this is what I think it is, Bob. Here's some medicine. Uh, Call me tomorrow. And the medicine worked overnight. I didn't have the problem anymore the following day. They had a specialist lined up if I needed to see a specialist. And, Cliff, that took place in four hours. That's amazing. Come on, I you know I don't care what hospital I went to or what doctor I went you to. I couldn't have, done any better I couldn't than have that. gotten anything that's better right. than that. That's, that's great. And so I've had some things and been sent up for some tests because they saw the results, you know, on a glitch and said you better mm-hmm. go get this checked out. And sure enough, they were right, but it was at its infancy, and you know, mm. it, it, it couldn't be better. So I know that there are horror stories, and I know that there are issues, sure. but um, there's a lot of people working really hard, and I got to see those people working really, really hard. And so if you'd like, I will share a couple things Please here do. that Please were brought do. up um, yeah. in our meetings and that were shared. That just sounds so great that that's happening. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And here, let me tell you, one of the reasons mm-hmm. is that the, the constituents of the, the congressional uh, staff hears very loud and clear what the veteran is saying. And they want to hear the, what the veteran is saying because they want to clean up any issues they have with the VA because— you and I both know how big the VA is. It is the second largest federal organization. Their budget is billions upon billions of dollars. And the most important thing, though, beyond those statistics, is the fact it's for the betterment of our veterans. And you and I also know that without those veterans, we wouldn't be sitting here. That's right. We wouldn't have the freedoms we have in this country and there are a lot of people that are responsible for that. And you just shared with me a few moments ago that things have been settled in a- Afghanistan today. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know from northwest Indiana there are 250 men sitting in Kuwait ready to react left, right, up, down if uh, something happens someplace. Mm-hmm. And I feel very relieved right this minute that you told me that. That's great. So isn't that great? It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it's absolutely mm-hmm. wonderful. And and you know, until I got involved in doing some of the things, I did not really understand what I just said to you. Okay. But behind each one of those young men is a family. That's right. That's right. And that family sits on edge every single day that that young man is over in Kuwait because they don't know where they are. Mm-hmm. And I have a very very good friend that is the command sergeant major of that group, and I was with him up until um, a few days before he deployed. And he had to leave his son who's married and his daughter-in-law is expecting a baby. One daughter is in a career and another daughter is in college. And I could see the angst in his face as he was having a picnic with them and throwing a football around. And he knew he wouldn't see him for a while. And in the past, he's deployed and the kids were smaller. And that, not that it's easier Kids can go play next door, you know, or or go do their homework and and stay busy. But now these are more adult children miss their dad. And I saw the look in his face, and I felt really bad for him because he's deployed like seven times. And I said, Ben, please be careful because I can see right here that's what you're leaving behind, and I know you don't want to leave them this time for sure. So that's what's behind all 250 of them. So there's a lot of sacrifices that these folks make for our country and when they come home the united states of america owe them the follow-up that's required for that transition sometimes it's maybe a couple hours Mm -hmm. and sometimes it may be a lifetime and we have to be prepared if we're willing to put them in harm's way we have to be prepared to take care of the consequences when they come home and you and i both have heard all the stories about this guy has a problem with this. This guy has a problem with that. This one gets in trouble with the law because of this problem and that, that type of stuff. And this country has to be prepared to treat these veterans 
as they should be treated because of what they've done. Bob, you know, you've done so much yourself, of course, and to bring about these issues and to tell us what's going on. First, I want to commend you again. Thank you. Because uh, what you've done is just, just nothing short of fantastic. Um, how are we doing? Do you think uh, things are going pretty well? Uh, you mean with the VA? Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to yeah, tell you exactly. this. Um, and I know you had some other things yep. you wanted to mention. No, no, th- this is the key. And, yeah. the, and you've got it there. You've got it the oh, long yeah. form. I've got the short form here. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. th- I think things are going very good. And uh, I'll touch on a couple of them. Sure, please. But the first one um, that the DAV brought to the attention of the Congress was um, something that just, to me, um, is kind of unbelievable. But we still have burn pits in our deployed areas. And a burn pit is how we get rid of waste and waste means a lot of different things it might mean a tire it might mean fuel it might mean human waste it can be all kinds of things and they burn it and it gives off a very toxic smoke a toxic odor and when i was in vietnam that burn pit was wherever it was convenient Mm -hmm. not not to the soldiers it was convenient because this happened here so we'd burn Mm -hmm. it here Mm -hmm. and and we still Go by that same philosophy. Instead of saying, well, we have a a need for a burn pit, which I can understand. Don't like it, but I understand it. Mm -hmm. Let's get it the heck out of here. You know Mm -hmm, what I mean? mm -hmm. To the far edges of where we're living. It doesn't have to be in the middle. It doesn't have to be in the central area. And dispose and move it and take it to where it's not going to create an environment that's so hostile to the human person. And so... That's one of the things that's brought out in the first thing we brought to Congress, and there's mm-hmm. several bills that are being considered today. But it's take a look at what we're doing in the environment that we have them living in, and let's make sure we're doing everything we possibly can to get it as far and as remote as possible. Now, Bob, we, we know about Agent Orange and so forth, but yes. these, these burn pits, they're, they're still going? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Think about this, Cliff. You know, some of those guys live in a very remote situation when they're deployed. It oh, was absolutely. A, yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. so what are they going to do? Th- yeah. They're making way, you know, in, in oh, the motor sure. pool, you sure. know, over sure. here, over here. Right. And they've got to get, you got to get rid of it. I mean, you right. can't just let it sit in a That's pile. That's true. Okay. I've been to countries where they live it let it sit in a mm-hmm. pile mm-hmm. and their home is rat infested outside the home sure when i was in because vietnam you know i saw that all the time right because it mm-hmm. went from whatever garbage they had right over the wall mm-hmm. and there it sat they were having dinner and 10 mm-hmm. feet away they were having this waste area well we we at least dispose of it by burning it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but we're not thinking all the time about what we're doing with that and so we have to acknowledge the fact that these burn pits are causing these issues with the guys and so we have to, number one, treat them when they come home if, if they, in fact, have yeah, been exposed okay. to this. And two, th- be much smarter about what we do and where we place those. Good. So that's what that that's first I- element was. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing was the one that I got to talk with uh, the folks about, and I feel honored to be able to talk about it. So um, it talks about how the VA is handling... Um, Suicides and mental health, mental health for those that come back. And primarily, we've kind of packaged some of that mental health discussion into things like PTSD, Mm -hmm. TBI, uh, which is traumatic brain injury, Mm -hmm. and then sexual trauma for the female service folks as they've been deployed. And so there are some things that are really, really important. I have another whole sub-booklet. Uh, that's called Prevents Program. It's put together by the White House. You don't have a copy of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's focused on suicide prevention. And the statistics that are gathered by the VA haven't changed much over the past several years. And that means that every single day, somewhere between 22 and 18 veterans commit suicide daily. Say that again, bro. 22 18 to 22, Mm -hmm. veterans commit suicide every single day. That's 6,000 per year. Now, we're going to take a little bit deeper dive because I experienced this in my family. And my nephew, who bore my name of 
called him Rob, Rob Carnegie. Mm-hmm. Spent four mm-hmm. years in the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And three, three years ago, was more due to not his military service, but family situations and things like that that created a lot of undue pressure. He couldn't cope with it anymore, and he committed suicide. And then the statistics in this book talk about what that means. And so when some, one of these veterans commits suicide, it impacts the lives of 135 people. Wow. Brothers, they sisters, mothers, oh, fathers, sure, and as- associated friends, and friends of friends, etc. Yeah, and so when I talked to the people about this and used that number, I said, in my own personal situation, I'll guarantee it was way more than 135 people were impacted by the death of my nephew. Bob giving us great information, as always. Uh, let's take a quick caller. Uh, Robert, hi. You're on WVON. Hello, America's Bill. Heroes Group. Bob, how y'all doing? All right, Robert. Okay, I'm a member of the DVA Blind Brothers Association of Blind DVA. And I know Bob know about the tea tournament every year we have in Riverside Casino. All blind veterans and, and vets with uh, you know, all kind of spinal cord injuries. Bob, do you know about that? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. I don't know all much, right. so please fill me in. Mm-hmm. But okay, every year in September, we have this 400 was, uh about 450 some blind deaths and uh, spinal cord deaths and amputees come to the Riverside Casino in our city, outside of the city. Wait, say, 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 say the city again, slowly. Our city. Which is in Iowa, Iowa City? Yes, yes. Iowa. Actually, Liberty, Iowa. You know, go Iowa City up there. No, I think. About 20 miles above no, Iowa City. And I was, you know. I- Iowa and, City? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I know. Okay, now I know what you mean. You got it. Yeah. Okay, at the Riverside Casino. Yep. And, and you should come up there and Brad, if you come over there, my name is Robert Mays, really. I call myself Robert M. If you, if you go to that website and look, you see guys rock climbing. Sure. Because knowing everything. Have you been there before? No, I have not, but I'm aware of some of these programs that, that help uh, our veterans. Uh, that that one I have heard of, but there's also one that's taking place very soon now out in uh, in U- in Utah, I believe, where they ski. Yeah. These uh, the wounded well, yeah, veterans uh, ski, and it's it's a a fabulous thing that's sponsored by the DAV, but it's it's something for wounded veterans that that are oh, yeah. immobile. Also, that's great. I Robert, I tell you anyway. what, you, Robert, tell me, do this for me, because we're about out of time. <laughs> yeah, leave leave your number with our operator. Please, would, okay. you, would you do that? Because okay, I, I, one more well, short thing, short thing. Yeah, I, I, I talked to the young lady the other night. I forgot my phone. Even on my call, but eight times she dropped me out. All right, we, yeah, we'll get your it. number because we're, we're out of time. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, listen, Robert, thank you so much, uh, Bob Carnegie. Um, you know what we're going to have to do is have you back. You know that, right? I'll be here. Okay, <laughs> I know he will. He's just great.